Bella, Bella, it's okay. Bella! Hey, well, I'm going to restart my computer and try to log on to the computer as well. But... Okay, so let's open up in prayer. How many people do we have on? With Linda's, I'm only going to see a few so I can see. Let's uh, see, yeah. we got Rabbi Adrian 14 times. Does that count? <laughs> this could set a new record. We want as many Adrians as we can on there. That'll, uh, that's funny. That's funny. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, let's let's open up in prayer and we'll start. And then I will try to log on with my computer because it'll be a little easier. Uh, so, Rabbi, you're going to see me try to log in again once my computer reboots and everything. But, uh, Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you uh, that we had an opportunity. And as you guys can hear, my voice is coming around. Amen. Hallelujah. And thank you, Father, for your healing in our midst and everybody who you're, you're, uh, you are uh, touching and moving upon and ministering to and bringing healing and joy and strength. And so, Lord, we just want to come before you and give you all the glory and praise. We look forward to all that you have in store for us. And Lord, we're so thankful that you're continuing, continuing to build Beth Yeshua to your glory, for your glory, Bashem Yeshua. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So the series that I'm going to start on is called Building Community. And so it's going to be a, a relapse of a lot of things that we, we've been talking about, especially what Rabbi and I have been talking about as far as joy in the community. And, you know, the joy is our strength and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing that we haven't even touched the surface of this. And I think it's so important because it's not talked about a lot. We're expected to be joyful, but nobody really teaches us how to be joyful. It's like we're supposed to be joyful, but how do we get into this joyful state? And so we want to talk about that because what we were talking about when I did my sermon a few weeks back, the right brain and the left brain, and that we're mostly a left brain body of believers that we do all the, the the reading of the word the studying the memorizing we do all the theo we got the theology down we got all these things that are taking place that we tend to to think that this builds discipleship and it does because those are important things but what happens is we forget about this this joy that is like our brains and our right brain especially our spirits need joy like we need oxygen it truly is that much is that we need to have that power of joy like we do uh, with oxygen, like a baby. I, I don't know if you guys, has, who's held a baby um, and haven't held a baby in a long time, but who's held a baby for like the first time and they're like within a week old and their eyes are still moving around and doing things like within a couple of weeks and all of a sudden their eyes lock on you and you smile. And what does that baby do? That baby just gets this huge smile. This baby gets this massive smile. And they sometimes, and when they hear other kids giggle, they start giggling. And the, it's almost like it's this first nutrient we did. We talked about the, the four nutrients that are important to really engage the right brain. And without joy, we only grow about eight years in the Lord and then we get stagnant. We only grow a, a, few, a little bit and it gets stagnant. So we want to look at the early community see where they gathered joy. Uh, we're going to do a joy exercise tonight, which is going to be kind of fun to start learning how to be joyful and more and more joyful and, and then go from there. Because I think that when we understand that joy does not displace other emotions that we have, like, you know, if we're grieving or if we're dealing with other issues, it doesn't, it doesn't dismiss those. We still face those things, but the scriptures tell us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy is what really helps us get through some of those emotions. So I'm hoping that you guys can really capture this as we move on with this, because we're going to talk about the nutrients that our brain needs, but joy is the first one. And even though my sermon talked about it, we have to dig in deeper because it's absolutely fascinating um, uh, when we start practicing joy. And, and so uh, let's open up in the book of Acts. And we go to Book of Acts. Let's see what the early community. Okay, now Rabbi, I'm gonna try to uh, try to join in again um, and see what happens here. Um, actually, I'll have to go to. The, it, there's no Bible study on there, so I'll just go to the uh, the internet and then try it again. And then. Um, let's so see. leave this on while you try that. Yeah, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, I'll leave it on. I'm coming in. Yeah, if I try to go straight to Zoom or use Zoom, um, it wants to there's no meeting for Bible study on there. So that's interesting. Because it's already started. Recording and recording and recording and recording. And recording. There you are. There you go. I will. 
I will, uh, I will uh, she's gonna turn off, turn off hers on the computer so we don't. I muted her, so we're okay. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, good. All right, okay. Hi. And you can even turn it off if you want. You can yeah. join us here. Yeah. Okay, guys, can you guys hear me fine and everything? Oh, this is so much nicer. Yeah, this is so much nicer. I know the lighting is, is bothersome, so I'll turn it just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so um, excellent. All right, so we got a little bit more room here, more things to talk about. Excellent. Um, let me push this camera back a little bit more. This camera is also crazy. It might fall on me. Who knows? Okay, so so we look at the book of Acts, and then we'll see uh, chapter one's just kind of a, you guys know, it's just a, a follow-up of what um, of what um, uh, uh, Luke wrote to Theophilus regarding the book of Luke. Okay, but here it says, uh, let's just do that recap, but let's go into this here. I wrote the first volume, Theophilus, about all that Yeshua began to do and teach up to the day he was taken up after he had given uh, orders by the Ruach HaKodesh to be em emissaries he, uh, um, he had chosen. To them, he showed himself to be alive after, he, after his suffering through many convincing proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, when, now while staying with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what his father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John immersed with water, but you will be immersed in the Ruach HaKodesh not so many days from now. So when they gathered together, they asked them, Lord, are you, are you restoring the kingdom of heaven at this time? He said to them, it is not your place to know the times or the seasons which the Father has placed under his own control. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and through all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. After saying all this, while they were watching, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they were staring into heaven as he went up, suddenly two men stood with them in white clothing. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you keep standing here staring into heaven? This Yeshua, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Uh, and then it goes on. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day walk. While they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and Jacob and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, Jacob, the son of Alphaeus and the son of uh, and Simon, the son of Zealot, or Simon the Zealot, and, with, and Judah, the son of Jacob. All these with one mind were continuing together in prayer, along with the women and Miriam, Yeshua's mother and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number, the number of names of all together was about 120. So we have 120 people here. Many hundreds of people saw Yeshua rise from the dead. Um, he spent time with the two disciples that were on their way to the, on the road to Emmaus. Um, for 40 days, he spent time with them. And so he had this core group of 120 people that were there. And so they were gathering together. And I think that, well, we have to understand the first aspect of joy in our relationship, especially as we're growing and Beth Yeshua continues to plug in and keeps going forward. And even though we, we lost some momentum with um, not having a couple of services because of, of sickness and stuff, we don't want to lose this aspect of 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 falling behind we want to continue to press in and to see god do but it, it does include this face to face panima panima al panim face upon face where we look upon one another and we see each other's joy for one another and then we start laughing sometimes i have to look at linda because she's got this look on her face i go what are you thinking about or what are you laughing about and she goes oh nothing just laughing or giggling or something and then uh, she has a great little laugh that I like. It's like she'll read a text or something and start laughing. And that laugh is engaging because it's like you hear her laugh and you want to hear what she's laughing about or you or she tells you what you, she's laughing about. And then you start laughing with her. Right. And if anybody knows Linda, this is this is kind of the stuff that she does. It's actually it's it's kind of fun. Um, uh, she builds great friendship around laughter. And I think that we forget that when we are seeing each other face to face, we see the joy of what it's like to be around, how somebody else feels about you when you see their face towards you. So when you see someone's joy in you, there's something that happens inside. And so one of the things that we can't neglect is, is getting engaged with one another. Zoom is wonderful for the Bible studies and stuff because I can see your faces, we're interacting, that kind of thing. But fellowship is very, very important. 
that starts building this culture of joy is that we have to gather. And as you notice that they prayed, they came together and they prayed and they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So there's this concept of waiting to one, waiting with one another and, and just getting ready to see what God was going to do, going to do. But he also promised something through the Holy Spirit. So that's the thing that we have to look at there as well. OK, so we see that here about 120 of them. The uh, and said, brothers, the scriptures had been have to be fulfilled, which the Ruach HaKodesh foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judah, who came, who became a guide to those who seized Yeshua, for he was counted among us and received his share of this office. Now, this man, Judah, I, I'm switching pages here, body filled with the reward of his wickedness, falling head first, he burst open in the middle of his intestines, splattered out or in his intestines splattered out. And it became known to all those living in Jerusalem. So in their own language, that field was called a keldama. That is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place become desolate and let there be no one living in it. And let another take his position. Therefore, one of the men who had accompanied us all the time that the Lord Yeshua went in out and out among us, beginning with his immersion by Johannan or John until the day he was taken up from us, must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That's really powerful. I don't know if people really catch that, but there was people that followed Yeshua from that very time on until he, he, he was ascended before them that weren't listed in the, in the 12, that, but were there for as a witness for everything. That's pretty powerful. Um, you know, that's pretty powerful for not being... Part of the 12 that Yeshua considered his close discipleship, you know, not having those 12, um, but uh, just being there. That's that's pretty amazing. OK, so we uh, we go here. So they nominated to Joseph called Versavis uh, of Varsavis, also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, you, O Lord, uh, who knows the hearts of all men, show us which of these two you have chosen to take possession in his office as emissary from which Judah turned aside to go to his own place. Then they cast lots for them and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was added to the 11 emissaries. Okay, either choice would have been great here. I think this is what you guys need to understand. Sometimes people can look at this and say, oh man, they're just gambling. They're just, they're not given an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to show up here. Actually, this is, uh, this is a, a part of kind of what they did back in those days, uh, especially this, but in the Ark of the Covenant, Rabbi, what did they have? They had two things in there. Remember what those were? Manna. The, human, the what? The, the, well, they had a lot of things in the Ark of the Covenant. Right. They had a right, jar right. of manna. They had the staff that bloomed into almonds. Right. And then they had the two, the, the, the Urim and the, and the Thummim. The Urim and the Thummim. Yeah, exactly. And they use those. It's interesting. So this is kind of similar to that concept there, because either one it would have landed on would have been the, uh, a great choice because they were with Yeshua this whole time, never left him, never forsook him, was there. They were witnesses to everything that took place. And so I think a thing that we can understand from this passage here, and I know we talked about joy and we're going to get to joy later, but I wanted to tear down at least chapter one and, and, and understand chapter two a little bit before we get into this. A building community, uh, building the culture of joy. But um, but here it's like we have to understand that 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 um, that either one was a great choice. And when we decide to pray and bring people into leadership, and we decide to do those things, we don't flip coins. But if the Lord led us to flip a coin and it landed on somebody, regardless of who we chose, I would believe that all of them would be would be would meet that requirement and fall into that category so it's important to pick quality leaders here they were looking for for quality leaders to fill one position and they trusted the lord with the choosing uh interesting anybody have any question about that at all can i add a comment sure i think that's so amazing that even though they weren't recognized throughout yeshua's life and ministry that Matthias is going to have his name on the foundation, I believe it is, in the New Jerusalem. So you might not think your ministry is important, but God knows, and God's going to have a memorial for your ministry Amen. in some way. Amen. We drove, we walked by, we were having lunch with a, a friend of ours, uh, flew down from 
um, from Maryland that those tells should I and she flew down and we were having lunch with her yesterday or day before yesterday mm -hmm. yesterday and we were walking by a guy in a Bentley with probably a two hundred thousand dollar car <laughs> and both both uh, uh, Linda and her was like oh the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous and I said well Lord keep blessing the wicked because eventually that's gonna that means more for us so keep blessing them Lord keep blessing them because it means more for us you know and it's like it's funny that somebody has like a two hundred thousand dollar car right there in front of you and it's like it's like you know and you think of the mansions and you think of all the stuff that you see and the Bible says no eye can see no ear can hear or conceive what God or no mind can conceive what God has in store for those who he whom he loves and it's like it's powerful when we see that kind of stuff and we're blown out of the water it's like you know Yeshua has been building for 2,000 years <laughs> he's putting some together you remember that uh Keith Green song everybody that you know um and he says that in there uh you know Yeshua or he uses Jesus but Yeshua has been you know been building for 2000 years and i can't remember the whole the, the song uh hear the bells ringing uh they're singing um you can't be born again so it's kind of cool so anyhow just thought i'd bring that up that's that god always has something in store that we're not always looking for so that so anyhow we get to chapter two and it says now when the day of shavuot the day of uh pentecost come they were all together in one place suddenly there came from heaven now this is interesting it says they were all together in one place it doesn't tell us it was the upper room um it could have been anywhere but most people assume it was the upper room because that's where they were staying and meeting so just for those of you that are sticklers about the upper room it doesn't really matter they were together in one place okay so that's really what's important suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and tongues like fire spreading out appeared to them and settled on each one of them they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and began to speak in other tongues as the Ruach enabled them to speak. Now, Jewish people were staying in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound came, the crowd gathered. They were bewildered because each was hearing them speaking, speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, all these who are speaking, aren't they Galileans? How is it that, that, we, each, uh, that we each hear our own birth language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and those living in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phygyra and from, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya towards Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jewish people and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own tongues the mighty deeds of God. How powerful is that? <laughs> Okay, again, these are Jewish people gathered during Shavuot. This is one of the required uh, festivals that they were required to go to uh, up to Jerusalem for, right? So this is the one of them. So Passover was one, and then 50 days later, you have Shavuot, okay? So you have that going on. And then they were together, so, uh, and they were all amazed and perplexed. I love that word, saying to each other, what does this mean? Others poking fun were saying that they're full of sweet new wine. And so then we see Peter get up and address the crowd, talk about this. He goes through this whole process and we won't spend time in it. Okay. But as you can see it in here, he talks about it. He brings up a uh, Joel prophecy in chapter two. He brings up Psalms. He brings up all these things. So he brings up Romans that we can find all that in here. Joel again, Psalms. So we see all this stuff he's doing. And then it says here, the men of Israel hear these words, Yeshua this is verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words, Yeshua Hanatsrati, the man authenticated you by God with mighty deeds and wonders and signs God performed through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Yeshua given over by God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge, nailed to the cross by the hands of lawless men you killed. But God raised him up, releasing him from the pains of death, since it was impossible for him to be held by it. For David says about him, and then he goes on and speaks that, I saw Adonai before me, for he is my right hand, so that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my body also will live in, in hope, because you will not abandon my, my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Highlight that, underline that. This is beautiful. You will fill me with joy in your presence. We talked about this word presence is the word panav in Hebrew, which means your face. So it's not just being near someone like 
I'm in Linda's presence, okay, but that I'm filled with joy in the face of being with Linda. So in the same sense, there's this, this concept of being filled with this presence, the face of God, and, and it's, it brings joy to my life, right? Just like we know when our parents are pleased with us, when we, when our, when we can remember our parents being pleased with us, um, it brought a lot of joy in our lives. I remember, I think I've shared this story before, but my daughter was not able to clean her room one time. Well, happened many times, but we'd ask her to go clean her room and she would fight and fluster and we'd walk in there half an hour later, she maybe moved a pencil, you know? <laughs> and then we go in there again and then, um, sorry guys, I'm gonna adjust it. I hope it doesn't fall and having problems with my camera staying on my computer. Okay, so um, anyhow, she go in there, we go in there 20 minutes later and hardly anything moved. We get a little upset about it. It's like, come on, come on, Becky girl, you could do a better job than this. And you're not coming out until you do it. So she'd stay in there. And sometimes three or four hours, not get anything done. And one, and then we were listening to Focus on the Family one time. And I heard this idea of reverse praise. And it was really talking about how that when we, when we, when we really are excited over one tiny little thing that our kids do, it, it brings so much pleasure and joy to them that you will be impressed or surprised by how much they do. And what's funny. What's, what's really amazing is that um, the very next time when we told her to go clean her room, I walked in one time and she had put away a couple of clothes and I walked in and it was just 10 minutes later or so going in there. I'm like, oh, wow, Becky, what'd you do? She would tell me what she did. I go, that's amazing. I can't believe you did that. That is awesome. And then I walk out the door and, and walking out the door, I'd walk in 10 minutes later and the room was almost clean, fully clean. And, and it was like, oh my goodness. It's like, wow, Becky, that's absolutely looked at. And then one time we told her to go in the bedroom and before I could even go in, she'd run out and say, look what I did, look what I did. And bring us back in there and, and make us look. And it was like this joy that she felt and this presence that she felt is, it blows me out of the water. It's like, it's like Linda says that she feels that presence of God, that face, that joy of God in her life when she dances. You know, if you guys saw us dance at our wedding, uh, you probably some of you may have seen it or not. But there's a picture that I have that I can bring to show you guys. It's actually absolutely beautiful. You'll see that me and Linda are dancing and I'm spinning her as she does this spin in my dance, you know, as I was dancing. And she's got this look on her face like I'm not there nobody is there no one right it's like she's off in nirvana or wherever you want to go. she's she in, had she's a in, rose in her teeth no <laughs> she should have both but she should have <laughs> but i'll tell you what it was really it was amazing it was beautiful it's like you see this picture and it's almost like uh it's almost like she is so elated that her feet aren't even on head on earth it's like she finds so much joy in it if some of you have ever seen uh, the Schindler's, okay, here it is right here. I'm going to blow it up a little bit and I'm going to put it towards the camera and see if you guys see her face. You guys see that? Can you guys see that? Okay, that's that's Linda right there. It's like she is in another dimension. <laughs> okay, she is in a total different dimension than, than, I mean, it's amazing. She's just gone. And she said that she feels God's joy in her and, and God's pleasure in her when she dances before him and gives him the great, the praise and glory. And if you guys ever watched um, the chariots of fire and you guys ever heard of Eric Little and you ever see the scene at the very end, I mean, get on YouTube and just watch it. It's like a two minute clip, three minute clip. And I would encourage you to watch it. It's this three minute clip of seeing Eric Little, even though he was portrayed by another guy that was playing for him. If you look at black and white films of Eric Little, you'll see that he ran like that too. But you'll see that he just ran totally out of control. His head would go back. He would get this smile. And every time I see that scene, I just want to cry because it's like, he, he goes, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Now, if we are motivated and it's the first ingredient soil in our right brain is to feel the joy, not only when other people look upon us, but when God looks upon us, one of the aspects to cultivating joy in our presence is to walk according to the gifts that God has given us. We have to walk according to the gifts that God has given us. If we're too busy trying to do things that other people want us to do, or we're too busy trying to please people, you know, one of the first things that Rabbi gave me when he uh, when he handed over the uh, baton is he gave me a list of some things. And the first one on the top of the list, he says, please God, not man. 
at all costs, please God. And, and, and it, it, there's something about it. When you are walking according to your gifts and you're doing what God's asked you to do, you are pleasing God. Now, it doesn't always please men. But when you please God and you experience this joy of God, his face shining upon you, which which is amazing because it goes right to Deuteronomy. Uh, I mean, Numbers chapter six, uh, verse 22, where and then also before that, when when God instructs Aaron and the priest and says that when you put my name, you put my character, my face upon the people, this is how I want you to do it. When he does that and it says that he puts that, his face shines upon us. That means he's finding pleasure in us because we're walking according to his ways. And that's what it's all about. So when we, we start walking according to the gifts that God has given us, and sometimes those gifts are hard. Sometimes we have to do, you know, I have a pastoral gift. Where that falls on my spectrum of one top five gifts, it's usually typically a two or a three um, the number one on there sometimes is faith in some of the tests I've taken. The other two, uh, teaching and, and pastoring go hand in hand. Um, Sophia spoke over me one time and said that she really believes that um, my pastoral gift is greater than my teaching gift, if that were possible. And she said that. And when she said that to me, it it really it was overwhelmingly um, what's that affirming. Affirming. It was overwhelmingly affirming. I I affirm it too. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Yes. And, I, and I'll tell you, when, when you hear something like that, not just from the people of God, but you hear that coming from the spirit of God in your heart, and it's affirmed and confirmed by others in your life, it makes you want to do a better job at everything you do. Isn't that true? Isn't that true for every single one of us here? Yeah, can I add a comment? Going back to Eric Little, his sister was concerned that he was running because she knew they both, Eric and his sister, knew that he had a call to go and be a missionary in China. And she thought that he was not doing God's will by spending time training to be a runner. And that's when he told her about God, he feels God's pleasure when he runs. God made him as a minister, as a missionary, but he also made him fast. Yeah. So something that doesn't look spiritual, God blessed him in it. Amen. So Amen. keep that in mind too, as you live and move and have your being in Yeshua. Yeah. What's beautiful about that scene is it was spoken in the chariots of fire, like maybe halfway through or a quarter of the way through in the movie. And then they requoted again at the end of the movie. And then you see his sister, Jenny, sitting in the stands where she is just, she's in tears, joyful tears, mm -hmm. joyful tears, because she sees the joy now of God in her brother. And that's beautiful. When you cultivate a, a, an environment of joy, we also celebrate with those who are walking according to God's gifts, and we embrace their joy as well. We don't try to take that joy. We don't try to snatch that joy away from people. Unfortunately, there's people out there that are like that, that they don't seem to ever have joy um, in their own lives. And when somebody else is happy, they, they try to take that joy from them. And unfortunately, that's a bad thing. And we want to move away from that. So we want to continue on and build, continue to build this culture of joy in our presence. And so the early believers had this in them because here, so let's go on here. Where am I? Uh, verse, um, let's see. Uh, oops, I flipped over here. Where should I be? Chapter. Okay, so it gets here. Brothers, I confidently tell you, uh, verse 29, I think. And that, is that where I'm at? Yes. Okay, so we saw that uh, the joy in the presence of the Adonai. Verse 29, brothers, I can confidently tell you that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. So because he was a prophet and knew God, had sworn with an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. David saw beforehand and spoke of Messiah's resurrection that he was not abandoned to Sheol and his body did not see decay. This Yeshua God raised up. We are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and receiving from the Father the promise of the Ruach HaKodesh, he poured out this. What you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, Yet he himself says, and then he shares that. Then you see thousands of people get saved from verse 37 down, okay? Um, and then it says here, verse 40, with many other words, 
he warned them and kept urging them, saying, save yourselves from this twi twisted generation. So those who received his message were immersed, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. That's absolutely amazing. Um, they were devoting themselves to, te to the teaching of the emissaries and to the fellowship. Okay, now remember, look, see, I want you guys to see this here. The teachings of the apostles or the emissaries, okay, and to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayer. The last three that are named there, the first one is a left brain activity. The other three are right brain activity. So for us to walk in a full brain discipleship mentality of cultivating joy in our presence, we have to add those other three. To the, We have to nurture our right, our right brain. Like I said during my sermon, our right brain processes information faster, but our right brain is what holds on to experiences and joy. But also, listen to this, our right brain also, because it processes faster, accepts, accepts uh, six things that are faster. Number one is, well, seven with trauma. But trauma goes through our right brain really fast. So if we've experienced a trauma in our lives, if we don't take care of that trauma, it'll keep us from experiencing joy down the road. And so when trauma takes place in our lives as young children, that trauma, if it's not taken care of properly or if you're not delivered it from it, for me, I had to deal with abuse and verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse by babysitters. I had to go through those processes, but I had to get delivered of those. And I got, fortunately, I got delivered of many of that when I was younger. But there's something here. I want you guys to look at this. It says they were devoting themselves to the teachings. So that's left brain activity, but then also to fellowship to breaking of bread, okay, and to prayers, okay? Those are right brain activities, right brain activities. We, we moved our Friday night prayers to Thursday night so that we can start encouraging you guys to start having Shabbat dinners with your family and friends. Start inviting people over for fellowship to your home. When I first got saved, now I don't know about you guys, but um, when I first got saved, I had three men in my life that called on me almost every single day and took me out for coffee to Denny's. I can't tell you how many cups of coffees that I've drank from Denny's over 30 years of being saved, but I, I'll tell you this, it's been a lot. Okay. And in that process, actually this, this year is a uh, uh, 35 years. I think I've been saved or so, or something like that, uh, 30 or 1985. And so now it's, uh, Oh, wow. Long time. But anyhow, they would pick me up on their motorcycle. I would meet them with my car. It didn't matter, but we would be at Denny's for hours, for hours, not just engaging in, in the word of God and talking in the word of God. And they were discipling me. Okay. But they were also sharing about their faith and they were sharing about things that they saw and how people got healed. And then we would go down and we would preach the gospel in the area where I was at, or we'd go to the streets in another city or go downtown Portland and we'd witness to the waitresses or, or I mean the servers, or we'd go down Portland onto the streets and witness to the people down on the streets. There was this right brain activity that was causing me to grow exponentially in the Lord to such a point that it was like, it was amazing. So I wasn't just engaging in left hand or left brain uh, uh, strength or strengthening my left brain by studying the word, by reading. I mean, in those days, I was pouring on the reading and reading and reading, but I was filled with, with fellowship all around me, all around me. I just was not fellowshipping on Shabbat and calling that good. I got together with people, and that's one of the reasons why we moved uh, uh, prayer from Friday to Thursday, so that we want to continue in prayer. That prayer is huge, and it's important. If it was important to the early community, it's also important to us, and we want more and more people to sign in for prayer. We want more and more people to engage in prayer, and we want them to be a part of the Thursday night prayer, but we want you to start engaging in Especially if, if, you know, we get through this sickness and everything like that. We want you people to start inviting people out to Shabbat dinners and, and to have people over to your homes. Continue to fellowship. And I think that's what's beautiful about the Messianic community, because we have things like this. Home fellowships are a huge right brain activity because you're breaking bread with one another. And you're sharing not only God's word with each other, but you're experiencing joy together. And it needs to be cultivated around joy. Joy has to be part of this. You can't dismiss joy. It, it cracks me up when you go to churches and they seem to be more, more uh, somber, you know, more like, 
you know, home, you know, it's like, yeah, if you crack a smile on that lip, if, if you know, God forbid there's a little cracking of a smile on there, you get a whip or a switch by a nun or by, that's just the Catholic, I'm just teasing them a little bit, but, uh, but anyone, you go to a Presbyterian church and it's like, you got it, it doesn't matter. You can go to a charismatic church and find no joy there because everybody's mad at each other because of the way they're using their gifts. They're not operating in love and they're, they're, they're hurting and offending one another and there's no joy there. There's gossip. Or there's slander, or they can't, you don't see the leadership supporting one another, you, all this kind of stuff. We really have to stay in this culture of joy. We have to find God's joy at all costs. And a lot of that is, again, number one, is understanding that, understanding his face over us, his face shining upon us, bringing that joy. Now, I'm going to show you tonight here in a minute. We're going to read a little bit more, and then I'm going to share with you tonight. I mean, we're going to do a little exercise, but before we do that, I want to show you how we cultivate joy in our right brain, especially. Okay, so we're going to do an exercise. Don't get all weirded out on me. And I'm not going to get all weirded out on you. But it is Bible study. But at the same time, we want to apply. Okay, so let's keep reading here. Uh, because, again, these three things are right brain. The teaching of the emissaries is left. Fellowship, sharing, you know, being with together. Breaking bread and to prayers. Fear lay upon every soul and many wonders and signs were happening through the emissaries. All who believed were together, having everything in common. This is what it means to bring to have fellowship with one another. They be they began selling their property and possessions and sharing them with all as they as any had need. Now, why do you guys think that? Number one, they were fearful of the Lord. They saw the mighty works and the wonders of God. But do you think there was joy in the midst of the, of the first early believers? Yeah, definitely, huge amount of joy. Tremendous amount of joy. Day by day, they continued with one mind, spending time at the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were sharing meals with gladness, with joy, with simcha, and sincerity of heart. I mean, pureness. Think about that for a minute. Joy in its purest form with one another. It's like, it's like that saying that rabbi has where we say it and every Shabbat, it's almost said where, where Jew and Gentile are truly one in Messiah. There's not a holdup in our congregation of whether or not you're loved on God because whether you're because if, if, if you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. We don't have that mentality in our congregation. I hope we don't have it. I hope that we the us Jewish people don't put out an air of arrogance that comes out that sometimes we don't recognize that we think that somehow we're more special uh, than you are in Messiah. We're not. Or not. There should be joy and acceptance, whether you're Jew or you're Gentile. Amen. And, and we want to continue to cultivate that because we want people to understand that they are truly one in Messiah. And so we're Jew and Gentile. Okay. And so it says here with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord was adding to their number, those being saved. That is powerful. OK, so the six emotions, the, the six emotions I was talking about outside of trauma, because trauma will stunt your growth. So if you if there's a traumatic event in your life, I want you to write down. I want you to start thinking uh, between now and this Shabbat. OK, make it a three or four day thing where you start looking at your heart and just saying, OK, is there I, I feel like I haven't grown in the Lord for a, for a while. Ask your Lord, ask yourself, Lord, is there some trauma that's holding me up? OK. Now, here's what happens when joy is not cultivated in this soil of our right brain. There are six uh, emotions, and those six emotions, here, you guys go ahead and write these down. You can let me, let me get to them. They're right here. I got to get flip over here real quick. Okay. Uh, when, joy is, when joy is leaking, okay, what we have here is we will find sadness, anger, fear, not a healthy fear, not the fear that we're supposed to have in the Lord, okay, but a, a fear. Like today's culture, you look around in our culture, media, the media and, and the government, they're spreading fear so heavily upon the people in this, in this world. Every government spreading fear, right? So we see that shame, disgust, typically in yourself. And if you are judgmental, it's disgust in others because they're not meeting your criteria of uh, of uh, good deeds that you have up in your mind or whatever somebody should be doing. And the last one is despair, okay? Hopelessness. So those, those six things. So unresolved trauma is kind of the breeding ground for this, okay? But sadness, anger, 
fear, shame, disgust, and despair. Those six emotions start coming in to you deeply and start bearing root into us. For whatever reason, this is what our brain does. When it doesn't experience this joy in the Lord, it starts filling up with other stuff. And when it starts filling up with these other things, you get stumped. And joy has to come in and renew that. Okay. So, and it, and the way you do it is, uh, is you just got to continue to fill your right brain up with joyful, uh, uh, joyful, uh, uh, pra- uh, uh, what do you call it? Exercises to help do that. Okay. So we're going to do this here real quick. Um, any questions so far at this point? Just unmute yourself and ask the question. Got to go back to me here. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna, sorry. I'm gonna, okay, right here. All right. Okay, so this is going to be good. Okay. So, um, so, all right. So, no questions. So, you guys all got it. Those six emotions really take over in our life. Now, here's what I forgot to add. Now, I said this during my sermon. Is when these emotions start taking over outside of joy. Because joy is one of those nutrients we need. Our soil, our right brain needs that joy in our lives. We need it like oxygen. Okay. What takes place, and I said this during my sermon, I'll I'll repeat it now, is narcissism. Okay. Narcissism takes place. And you become more important than everybody else in the midst. When you get corrected, you leave. When you when you get corrected, it's all about you. When you get corrected, you have to you have to blame somebody else or take some you know not take responsibility for things in your life. Yeah, everything that becomes this is my my understanding of the scriptures. This is my fellowship. This is this is my belief system. This is what this is my God. This is my body. This is my my passage. And so you start formulating theology around a very self-centered uh, theology that puts you at the, in the place of everything that surrounds you. And when you get to that point, that it's very hard to break that narcissism unless you're willing, unless you're willing to start cultivating a presence of joy in your life. Did everybody catch what I say there? Everybody following me? Okay, so we don't want to build narcissistic people in our presence. Amen. We want to keep walking in joy. So here's an exercise and it's a gratitude. It's gratitude will open up the door to joy in your life. Gratitude. Okay, so this is very, very important. So think about a memory in your life. So write this down and we're going to do this here after I speak it. Think about a memory in your life for which you are grateful. It can be a big thing, you know, like a birth of a child, a grandchild, your child, or a small thing like a beautiful sunset, uh, the water. When I see the ocean, I get I get bubbles of joy in my heart. It doesn't matter as long as you feel gratitude when you think about it. So there needs to be something that you feel gratitude about. Is it your spouse? Is it a meal? You know, um, you know. For me, when I hear the word sushi, my whole heart, my whole body starts getting all excited because I love sushi, even though it's the rice is bad for me being a type two diabetic. I got to stay away from the rice, but I love sushi. So, so think about that big or small, as long as you feel gratitude. Okay. Now give yourself, uh, give yourself a two or three word title for that. A two or three word title. So it can be, um, you know, uh, let's say I'm just going to do an example as we're going along. I'm going to say the beach because I love hearing the roaring of the water. Uh, I love hearing the, the, seeing the water go out. I love seeing the beauty of it. Um, I love seeing the bubbles, the life in it, the people having fun in it. So I'm going to call it uh, uh, my day spa, okay? So I'm going to just say day spa because it brings a lot of gratitude to my heart, okay? Um, and now in a quiet place, so when we when we close off here, in a quiet place, we're going to go back into that memory and we're going to relive it for a minute like you're back in that place. So for an actual minute. You're going to try to extend that in your life, okay? So you're going to, it's called a gratitude moment. So for one minute, relive it. Sitting at the beach, you know, sitting there or in the water, you know, for me, whatever it is for you guys, whatever it is, okay? And then you're going to ask yourself this. What did you feel in your body during this time? After you relive it for a minute, write down, what did you feel in your body? Some of you are going to write down things like, man, I never felt lighter. Or you're going to say, wow, I haven't felt that joyful in a long time. Or, wow, that brought me to tears. 
Linda did this exercise the other day and she, she was in tears. She was brought in uh, in tears because um, you said it was a beautiful thing, right? Yeah, um, because of feeling God's pleasure when I dance. I imagined, you know, I just did a little dance doing, you know, and feeling his pleasure again. And it was so beautiful to experience his pleasure once again, to know this is how I can enter into his presence. Ah, that's beautiful. Okay. So ask yourself, what did your body feel? Okay. Maybe peace, lightness, whatever. Okay. Um, you have to feel something in your body during that time. The second question you can ask yourself is, will my God be communicating to me? Okay. Through that memory and the peace you feel. Was God, is God with me? Like to share his beauty, his beauty, is God with you? Does he like sharing his beauty with you? Um, does he like those memories as much as you like those memories? I think this is really important because we build a cult of, we, we cultivate our left brain all the time. And we still have people in our midst that aren't set free and experiencing God's joy in their lives. I mean, it's really sad. It's really sad when you've been a believer for 20, 25 years and you have not experienced God's, God's joy with you. You know, you're still questioning whether or not you're going to make it into heaven because you don't know if God is pleased with you or he's happy with you. You haven't trained your right side to really hear from God. This is where prophecy comes from. This is where so much stuff comes from, from our right side of our brain, that we need to hear God's face and we need to hear his pleasure with us so that we can hear his words so we can follow his lead. And sometimes his words aren't pleasant, but there's joy in the process of that. Okay, because he knows how to discipline us properly. So we're, as we do that, then we're going to do this. Start start compiling compiling a list of grateful memories as described above. So make a list. 10, 10 memories, 15 memories, whatever it is. Okay. And each memory has two characteristics. One, you feel gratitude in your body and you feel a connection with God in that memory. Okay. For me, I think of the, when I'm by the ocean, I think of the greatness of God the goodness of God. I think of God's provision when it comes to food, because um, fish is one of my favorite things. And, and, but just seeing God's provision out there and to see the, the joy that he brings with it, it's almost like a theme park all on its own that God has designed in our presence. And if you look about it, the ocean reminds me of the seven feasts and festivals outside of Shabbat every week, because, because those are the times where God wants us to get together and find joy and happiness in one another outside of Yom Kippur. But even Yom Kippur is a joyful time because we're being set free from sin. And we feel this lightness because we've been set free and, and we're so thankful to God. So this attitude of gratefulness or gratitude is really important to cultivate a atmosphere of joy. You enter into my courts with thanksgiving or my gates with thanksgiving and you enter into my courts with praise right? So we cultivate joy in our lives by being overwhelmingly grateful to God for every thought that we can think of. So as you build this list of thoughts, okay, you do that. Um, you want to build at least 10 to 15 of them. And then once a day, spend five minutes residing in the gratitude using this list of grateful memories, okay? And it, it needs to be a nonverbal, nonverbal uh, we have to, we, and it's interesting. If you want to speak out to God, please speak out to God. But it's interesting what takes place with this nonverbal gratitude to God, because what you're doing is you're experiencing that joy. You're experiencing that moment. You're experiencing that pleasure and connecting it with God and the, and the feeling that it gives in your body. Okay. It sounds kind of, uh, I'm, I'm kind of giving counseling tonight, but it's important that we understand this because, because marriages have been saved simply by cultivating an atmosphere of joy in their marriage, okay? People have been set free of traumas and dr traumatic traumas in their life by cultivating an attitude of joy as they go through it because the Lord is, his promises are true and, and sure when he says that the joy of the Lord is your strength or my strength. It's not a, it's not this like when you're happy, somehow, somehow you just, you're excited in the Lord. No, it's, it's, it gives you, it truly gives you strength to get through the things that we need to get through. So it's a, it's a very sure thing. Linda, you raised your hand. Yeah, I just thought it might be helpful to go through some of the examples that I also wrote down so that you can begin to build yours. Okay. So one of my happy places is a garden with multicolored flowers. 
And what that shows me, and I'm grateful for God, is those are the places where I have great peace. I can really enjoy the peace of God and his beauty. I think about the beauty of his holiness. Um, so those are the aspects of God that I enjoy in that place. Another one like Adrian is in the ocean. Um, actually swimming in the ocean is an excitement. I feel the power today. I was there at the beach and I felt the power of the waves today. So not me. I had to work. <laughs> the poor guy. <laughs> so I could see God's power in the earth. It's much greater than what we can imagine, but just that little bit of power in the ocean. I am grateful for God's power over everything because this is a crazy world. We need to rest yeah. that he's got power over it all. Another happy place is hiking the, in the forest. That gives me peace, but I also like hiking uphill, which we don't have hills here in Florida. But uphill, there have been times when I re like one of the Psalms says, the horse rejoices in its strength. And I felt that when I could hike uphill and enjoy the strength that God had put inside yeah. me to be able to go up the hill. Mm -hmm. And I know that he brings that joy or that strength into us. So I'm grateful for those things. Okay. Hey, guys, I have to use the restroom real quick. But as Linda shared hers, would somebody else open up and share kind of what they were a thought that they had that just came to them while you're writing it down if you have one? Um, I'll be right back, but let's kind of open this up for a discussion right now, just to hear back um, um, one of these memories or some of these memories. Well, I'd, I'd like to share one. Amen. I will tell you that I am filled with joy when I watch our congregation worship. That just fills me with joy that you can't imagine. Yeah, knowing that God dwells in our praises, that's just such a powerful thought. It brings me to tears. Tears of joy and not sadness. So Rabbi Adrian was mentioning, you know, holding babies. And I, I'll have, I have a, I say I have a way with uh, kids and with dogs, not so much with adults. <laughs> But I can go into a restaurant and a, a little one will catch my eye, you know, and throughout the whole meal, they'll be looking for me, you know, and I'll be looking out back at them. And when I leave, I wave, wave goodbye. They wave goodbye back. You know, it's just that's just so cool. That's awesome that you have a gift with children and with dogs, too. But I think yeah, knowing that God has his heart on the tiny ones too. His eyes are always on the children. That's how you have God's gift. Excuse me a second. Okay, I'm back guys, sorry, apologize. Okay, well, I, I can attest to what Rabbi was saying there because I'll, I sit at an angle where I can see Rabbi and uh, when worship is really powerful and people are dancing and the shofars are going and I'll turn around and look and I can just see people just getting into it and stuff and i'll look over at rabbi and he'll be in tears with a smile on his face like you wouldn't believe it just um i can attest to that and um even with what mona was saying uh the children and dogs but in our memories as we do these memories let's be as specific as you can with a particular memory and then really try to meditate on it with a nonverbal gratitude because sometimes we talk too much in the presence of god we need to start listening and trying to hear God speak to us. Sometimes we're doing all the talking in our prayers. We're talking all the time and we're never get, taking the time to really just listen to him. And so if we can listen to him a little bit more and hear, hear what he hears and, and feel these, these uh, what do you call it? These experiences that God is, or these emotions, there you go. God has given us certain emotions that we're afraid to experience. And I don't know why. I don't know why. People feel like it's wrong to experience joy in their lives. It's almost like they feel like if they're joyful, they're not holy. And yet God has designed this to be something that we need. 
We need it. Children, we see it through children. They don't care what color they are. They don't care if they're rich or if they're poor. They don't care. They don't care, um, you know, if they're boy, male or female. I mean, I'm telling you, when these little kids get together, we're talking like toddlers. When they get together, before they experience what's going on between their differences of sexes and all this kind of other stuff, or black or white or Hispanic, they are finding so much joy of just being in each other's presence. And that's the part that God wants us to engage in that builds fellowship, that builds us in a way that, uh, in a way that um, memorizing scripture and reading the word and study, those, those are tremendous, but they, we will not grow the way God designs us to grow if we dismiss the other part. Okay, the joy that's found in fellowship, breaking bread with one another, um, you know, just breaking bread and, and sharing testimonies with one another. You know, that's why that's why we started cultivating um, testimonies in our in our uh, in our um, um, services. our services on Shabbat. Every other week we have somebody share a, a service. We have a lot of things. One thing we brought in the Oneg and we changed the chairs instead of everybody sitting side by side and just looking forward to nothing. We put them in a circle so that they can face one another. Mm -hmm. Right. There's something that happens when we do that, when we face one another and we're able to experience that joy as we're looking at each other and we're sharing or somebody sharing a funny story and everybody's watching and they're seeing that that we respond to that. So those kind of that's why I think messianic congregations are perfect for cultivating God's uh, God's joy in our midst because of how it's designed uh, the Torah. We're doing a walking in the Torah. We're not just reading the word of God, but we're doing the marching or the procession of the Torah. And we're walking behind it with music and we're adding to it. You know, the right brain is connecting here. We're actually experiencing God by walking behind the Torah with joy and shouting and raising our hands and the Torah being lifted and carried and danced with. That All that stuff cultivates the right brain. So this is what we want to continue to do. So let these memories be as specific as they can. When you meditate on it for the, for, for a minute, ask yourself those questions. What, what emotion am I feeling here? And how can I connect this to God? Or how is God connected to me through this, this memory? And then when we build that list of 10 every day, now, if you could do it three times a day, that's where we want to go, okay? Where when you have a list of 10 to 15 things, and I would say to just keep adding to that, but when you have 10 or 15, about Three of those thoughts will consume about five minutes. So if you take five minutes of nonverbal, nonverbal gratitude every day, okay? For me, I had kind of a little bit of time to do that because Linda went to go uh, see our friend down from um, um, El Shaddai, and they went to the beach together and everything like that. I got to stay home, but before I, I dived too heavily into work, I was, I was going through this process of reading the scriptures, but then I also meditated, and it was important to meditate on these memories because it, it gets you in a better mood. <laughs> it really does. It just changes your attitude, everything about it, so I want to encourage you guys to do this for five minutes every day, and if you can do it three times a day using different memories that are linked to um, joy and gratitude, uh, especially gratitude, make it centered around gratitude, you'll start experiencing God's joy. Now, if you aren't getting to that point where you can't do that, then most likely there's some kind of traumatic event in your life that's keeping you held up, okay? Something's going on, and listen, we have qualified, very qualified people in, in our midst, of very qualified people to pray over you, to help you get delivered, um, uh, if, it, if it is deliverance, if it's something that's traumatic, that is PTSD or something like that, you know, obviously I'm a counselor, but we have other people in our, in our congregation that are gifted in prayer. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, um, we have a strong leadership team. Uh, they've been around the block a few times. Our leadership doesn't, um, we're not naive to, to uh, spiritual things around us. We're not naive to, to thinking that, uh, you know, life or things will get better. Sometimes we have to meet things where they're at and deal with them. And so traumatic events are one of those things where you have to deal with them or you won't grow. But we have people in our present, in our midst that will help us grow in those areas if we're open to it. Okay. So any questions at this point? Any more memories that somebody wants to share that's connected to gratitude and, and you can connect it to God? Two things I'd like to add. Okay, cool. Um, Mona, when you mentioned dogs, I also love dogs. And that reminds me of God's unconditional love for us. Amen. Dogs are a beautiful example of God's unconditional love. 
So that thank you for giving me that one. I will uh, meditate on that as one of mine as well. Amen. Um, the other one was in Zechariah. It says that God rejoices over us with singing. Amen. So if he does that for us, we as his children are made in his image. We can rejoice for what he has done for us. Okay, so I want to share two more scriptures with you guys. That was really good. Now, anybody want to add to what Linda was just saying there? That was really good. Rejoice, rejoice, daughters of Zion. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody flip over to John. John chapter 17. This is just to confirm how much God, God has. In John chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse, uh, let's start, um, yeah, verse 13. John 17, verse 13, but now I am coming to you. I say these words while I am still in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into this world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I make myself holy so that they also be made holy in truth. The first thing he's saying, he goes, but now I am coming to you. He's talking to the father and he's saying, but now I'm coming to you. And I say these words while I'm still in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. That's powerful. <laughs> if you guys didn't think Yeshua was having fun at the wedding in Kana, you know, or in Cana, where he made the uh, water into wine. If you didn't think Yeshua was having fun with the apostles or the children, or when he saw Zacchaeus, was it Zacchaeus or, or who was it? Zacchaeus, uh, the little guy that climbed up in the sycamore Zacchaeus. tree. Zacchaeus, who climbed up in the sycamore tree. I mean, that would make me laugh if I saw somebody up there hanging out. Hey, what are you doing up there? <laughs> okay, I mean, Yeshua found joy in, in life. He, 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 I mean, when you look at the feasts and festivals, we have fun. Passover is powerful. It's joyful. It's exciting. The Feast of First Fruits, you know, um, uh, you know, you name it. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those, those uh, Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit coming on. I've never seen anybody filled with the Holy Spirit and truly being filled with the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues for the first time or so excited about God that they stop laughing and having fun. I've never seen anybody do that. And if they did, I'd probably smack them a little bit and wake them up. No, I wouldn't do that. No, but it was just like, it's like, come on, there's, there's joy here. This is amazing thing. Uh, uh, Sukkot, you know, the, the thought of just spending eternity with God and being with him for a thousand years, reigning with him as princes, uh, princes and princesses, um, you, you name it, um, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, you name it. So he wants all this stuff. And in here he's saying that his joy needs to take full measure in each and every one of us. Think about that for a minute. He wants his joy to be at full measure. Not at half full, but full measure with us. So that's powerful. Okay, and the last one is everybody go to Numbers chapter 6. And we all know this one. Numbers chapter 6. And... Start at verse 22. It says, again, Adonai spoke to Moshe, saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, thus you are to bless B'nai Israel by saying to them, Adonai bless you and keep you. We know that term keep you means to guard you, watch over you, to protect you, to, to fully embrace, embrace you with the power of the Holy Spirit around you. Okay, Adonai, make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. You can replace that. You can definitely replace that with may, may Adonai's face bring you joy. And may you see the joy of his face surrounding you. Okay, and let his grace be around you. Adonai, turn his face toward you and grant you shalom. Again, it's the southern aspect. When you, it's a Hebrew idiom when it says turn his face toward you. It's not like he's turning his face to. It's like he's remembering you. It's like he's looking 
intently upon you with this joy and his pleasure in you. And he's giving you fullness and wholeness and shalom. Not just peace, but this fullness and wholeness of who he created in you. Um, this is really important for us to capture and get a hold of. Okay, because again, we have a lot of believers that have been walking with God for many, 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 many years who doubt that God loves them. And because they're held up by emotions that are fueled by joy. If, let, me, let me ask you something. If we are all have a, a vehicle here. Let's say you are a vehicle. Whatever vehicle you can think of. Let's say you want to be a Lamborghini. Okay? Even a Lamborghini can only go so far without fuel. Believe it or not, even a Tesla can go so far without its fuel. Now, it doesn't use the same fuel as a Lamborghini. But without electricity, Tesla isn't going anywhere. Okay, and without fuel, I don't care how beautiful a Lamborghini is, it's useless without fuel. We are vessels designed by God, and the emotion that we need most in our bodies, like we need air in our lungs, is joy. We need joy like a car needs fuel. We have to find joy, or we are just a bunch of prunes walking around with scowls that reach way down here on the corners of our lips, way down here at the edge of my beard. You know, we're walking around, we're the most miserable of all people. And then we're like, well, how come nobody's coming to services? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, we got to walk in joy. Amen. So we need it. And I don't want to overwhelm you. I wanted to get you started on this. And I would encourage you to start doing these exercises tonight. It's okay to do two of them tonight before you go to bed or one right after we get done. Again, find Find a, 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 a find, um, what do you call it? Um, a thought of being grateful before the Lord, something that's grateful to the Lord of a thought that you had. Meditate on that for a minute. Ask yourself the two questions. What am I feeling here when I hear this? And how can I connect God to this feeling of gratefulness and this and being nonverbal? And then making a list of many, uh, many memories, 10 at least. Okay. And then going through that exercise of for five minutes long being non-verbally grateful to God for that experiencing that that whatever feeling you're getting of that particular thought in your mind and start let's start cultivating that in your heart and your life and you'll you'll find that you'll start walking with joy and you'll start being a uh, um, more joyful about the day and the events and the things that have come okay any questions before we close i know it's a quick meeting tonight you guys are used to staying up till 10 o'clock or 10 30 in the last few but rabbi david you have your hand raised no i'm just resting it with your first. Oh, okay okay <laughs> all right ben i look purple again what is up with this i'm wearing a green shirt i don't know i'm do just I'm going not... to call you barney that's all. barney oh my gosh i am like look, look how purple i am golly that's well even with the spotlight you gave me i'm still purple this but the crazy. spotlight is in the wrong place. It shouldn't be behind you. It needs to be in front of you. Yeah, but yours was up on the side there. So I thought that would work too. But I've got ceiling lights to come right down. I'm not even using the other one. Wow. Well, and I have my ceiling light on, that ceiling light on. So it should be in front of me, not behind me. Or not beside me. It should be on the front. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I'll try it. Well, man, I'm purple. I'm purple as could be. Well, maybe it's because she's wearing a we'll purple. We'll get you uh, there. Oh, okay. There you go. Is it a little better? Is this that's a little right. better? Okay. Well, I still it's a bit too much. No, that's okay though. All right. So anyway, can we? You know, uh, you can uh, adjust that. You can make it lower. Oh, I didn't know that. Back. Oh yeah. Okay. See, there's a knob. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. See. Oh, now, now you can't. don't look like Barney. Now I can't. I can't see. But that's okay. All right. All right. I just, my eyes looked at the light. Don't look at the light, Adrian. Don't look at the light. That's how the flies get caught. Okay. So, okay. Is there uh, any questions tonight or any, any um, additions that people want to add tonight? We'll look at, we'll look at um, uh, acts again, but we're going to see this culture here pretty soon because what we're talking about is building community. So first of all, we had to understand what the community was going on, but we're going to build this community and we're going to continue to build this community. You're going to see some things that the early believers were doing in the book of Acts that really solidified their unity. And it just, I mean, we're starting to see it a little bit here in chapter three uh, or chapter two here, where they were selling all their goods and their possessions, bringing everything so no one was lacking. And they were adding to their number daily. But you'll see this tremendous amount of joy among the believers.
And, and that's kind of what really built that. They were excited to know that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords showed up. He showed up. He showed up. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And they were getting this concept. A lot of times we mistranslate it. But we get this word. You remember the gates of Hades. We hear this all the time. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against the what? The kahal, the church or the believers, the body of believers, right? But this word against is not in the Greek. Remove that from that sentence. Okay. It really means withstand or I mean with uh, with. Uh, so really, when you when you read that passage, it's the opposite is being there. The gates of Hades shall not withstand. Withstand. So it's, you see this reversal perspective in there in the context of what it's saying here is as God's kingdom advances. The, the uh, Hades will not prevail. It's not so much the church can't go against what, what you know, like we're, we're in a defensive position trying to hold back the enemy. It's the other way around. But translators put in this word against and why they put in this word against the way we read it doesn't really sit that way. It doesn't, it's not true to the passage. When you look at the entire passage, it's withstand. So the gates of Hades shall not withstand the kingdom of God. It can't. It can't do it. So when we advance in the kingdom of God by, by us seeing people get set free and people getting saved and we're walking in joy and people are wanting to tear down that joy and, and try to rip that joy from us. You know, even, even like, why so downcast all my soul? Put your hope in God, right? That song that we heard, that when we continue to do the act of God, especially walking out in joy in the midst of trials around us, the enemy can't withstand it. And that's really what that passage is saying. It's not saying that somehow we have to be in a defensive position and hope that we'll get through this. No, it's the other way around. And so that's one passage. That, I mean, we could look at it next week for sure. Um, and I can break it down for you. But the word against is not in the Greek in that. And it was it was a tr put in there through translation to help us read it a little bit better. But that word didn't mean what it means today. And, and by them using it the way they did, unfortunately, it sits in our minds of not realizing that Hey, wait, it's the other way around. So uh, anyhow, any anybody want to say anything uh, or build on what I said tonight? I like changing that, that we're not on the defensive, but we're going against the gates of hell because it also, um, when I saw in Exodus, when God was bringing the children of Israel out, he said to Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and tell him to bring out my forces. Mm -hmm. So he saw the Israelites as slaves and calling them his forces, his, essentially his army. That's so awesome. Yeah. Amen. Powerful. Hallelujah. Well, why don't we close in prayer? Sheila, would you mind closing us in prayer for tonight, please? Father God, we, we come to you in unity, Father, and we thank you. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for being together. We thank you for the word. We thank you for Rabbi Adrian and Linda and, and uh, what we have learned tonight. There is so much to learn, and we do want to have joy in our lives. And we thank, we thank the situation for that, that we're, we're discussing this because it lifts us up, Father. You lift us up. Father, this is what you want to see. We're pleasing you. We want to please you and please each other, Father. We thank you so much for this evening. In the name of Yeshua, amen. 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 Thank you, Sheila. And like I mentioned, uh, we're going to, the next few uh, Wednesdays, we're going to cultivate this uh, uh, community um, and talk about building community together at Beth Yeshua and how important it is to um, to walk in joy. That's just one ingredient. And I'm going to ask you about it next week. And then we're going to talk about the other four, the three, there's, there's four total, but three ingredients that we need to take care of this right brain. And as we continue to walk in this right brain, and you're going to grow in your faith, and it's going to be exciting to see what God's going to do in your midst, because your faith is going to grow. And we're going to see the power of God in our presence, and it's going to be wonderful. Um, already right now, I'm experiencing uh, just joy because my voice is coming back after two and a half weeks. This is great. So uh, it is getting a little tired. So we'll, we'll close tonight. Thank you for uh, the prayer, Sheila. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for tuning in. Sorry, it was a little late. My computer wasn't working with me very well. So, But we're back on and good to go. So God bless you guys, and have a wonderful yes. evening.
Yes. Bye. 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 Thank you. You're welcome.